start with number 326, Look and Live.
Great words in that song, amen? Yes, sir. Mm. Ought to take everything to Jesus. Yeah. Ought to not make a move, ought to not do a thing without taking it to Jesus. You say, oh, maybe he's too busy. No, he ain't. No. No. He's, no. he's ready for you to bring every little thing to him. Amen. All right, Brother Terry. 309. 309. Amen. <clears throat> Man of sorrows, what a name. My sorrow he bore. You hear me? Yes, sir. <clears throat> Amen. Man of sorrows. <laughs>
foolish posts on Facebook this morning about those trying to make the argument there's no hell. Yeah. There is a hell. Yes, sir. And I say this, if the preacher can't convince you, the teachers can't convince you to teach the Bible and truth, if the Bible itself can't convince you, three seconds after you're dead, God will convince you. Yes. There is a hell. Yes. Uh, you need to be saved today. If you're not yes. saved, don't put it off. Uh, you don't know when your last breath is taken. You just right. don't know. Uh, don't put it off. Be saved today. For there is a hell and there is a Savior who's waiting yes, to save you. What a give you eternal life. Hallelujah. What a Savior. Amen. Amen. All right. 
forgiven when mercy walked in. Amen. Yes. Now I'm telling you what, you go to that judgment seat, you better have mercy. Amen. You better know the mercy seat. You better you better know the one who is the mercy seat. You better know the one who is the blood on the seat. Yes. He walks into the courtroom, everything, all charges are dropped. Yes. <laughs> Hallelujah. Yes. Second Timothy. Second Timothy. I'm preaching basically on that subject this morning. If I get there, I don't know. I'll tell you, I'm, I'm a little bit discombobulated. I'm not preaching on what I was aiming on preaching on this morning. Uh, I had uh, made a couple of visits yesterday and uh, went down and spent some time with Uncle Ralph and I then went by over and spent a little time with uh, Brother Fred. Uh, they both, of course, I, I talked with them about the Lord and, and talked with them about the joy that awaits us. Uh, and uh, all of them, both of them, uh, said almost the exact same words to me. They said, I'm ready. Yes. I'm ready. I got to thinking about that and, and uh, how God is using the circumstances of their life that they're going through to be a testimony to other people. And I'm thinking, are we really ready? Are we really ready? Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. The Paul's given his final uh, charge, his final words to his preacher boy Timothy and this is what he says I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom first thing he reminded Timothy that there's a judgment coming yes. of the quick and the dead the quick means the living those that are saved the dead are those who have died without Christ that second death will be a reality for all people who do not know, have not received the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. That great white throne judgment that's spoken of in the book of Revelation where all of the living and all of the dead are brought there before Christ and their lives are judged and then they're cast into a lake of fire. Why? Because there's no means of salvation for them. They've rejected the only hope that they had. They rejected the only mercy that would have delivered their soul. They, they rejected the only payment that God would ever receive for their sins, the blood of Jesus. So I reminded Timothy that there's... Uh, Judgment coming. And he said the answer to that judgment is verse 2. Preach the word. Yeah. God's word has the answer for man's needs these days. We live in a world that is about as messed up and weird as I've ever seen in my life. I forget what we're up to. 70, 80, 90 genders. They don't know whether they're male, female, or somewhere in between, or upside down, or whatever it might be. God's word settles that once for all. He created the male and female, period. Yeah, yeah. And however you're born is however you is. That's right. Preach the word. The word of God will change people's lives. It'll either, you know, you think about a creek bank in the, in the wintertime and uh, you, you, you see out here the river may be frozen over, the sun comes out, the banks thaw out, and uh, it may even get a little slick and muddy on top, but there'll still be ice in that water. When the Word of God's preached, some people's hearts just get cold and hard. Other people's lives get softened and turn to the gospel of Christ and get saved. Preach the Word. Be instant in season, out of season. There's no such thing as a proper time to preach God's Word. It's always proper yes. to preach God's Word. Well, we've got to keep God's Word in the church house on Sunday. You can't bring it outside the church house and preach it any other time. I mean, it's not the proper place for it. It's not the season for it. 
God's Word is always in season. It's in season in your personal life. It's in season in your home. It's in season in the church. It's in season in our society. It's in season all around this world. It's the only thing that will change man and set him on a course of some kind of sanity in a world that's gone mad because of sin. Yes. Reprove. Well, people don't like that. Rebuke. They don't like that. Exhort. Oh yeah, exhort me. <laughs> Encourage me. Lift me up. But the Bible teaches clearly that the gospel is two parts negative, one parts positive. We need to know what sin does to life. We need to, to know that if we play and toy with sin, it'll destroy us. Even as a Christian, when you're, once you're saved, delivered from the penalty of sin doesn't mean that the power of sin still can destroy your life. Can't touch your soul. But man, you can sure make life miserable on this earth for you. So reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Long suffering. It's a picture of our Savior. He's long-suffering. God's been long-suffering humanity all these years. He, he laid the blood of His own Son out there at Calvary as the payment for sin. And now for 2,000 years, He's been waiting upon men to receive that salvation. To receive the forgiveness of their sins. And doctrine. Man, where does, where does, where does sound doctrine go on these days? Good, solid Bible teaching. Because there's every kind of idiotic teaching there is out there that you can come by. They, they're going back into history, digging around in the roots of things that have been gone for hundreds of years and dragging them back up and teaching them as doctrine in the church. Yeah. It's crazy stuff. Let the Bible teach us. Want to know why they want to change the Bible? Because then they can change their doctrine. Yes. Mm -hmm. But when the old book says don't do that, don't do it. That's right. When it says do do this, apply that to your life. <clears throat> God's word. God's word. He says the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. I tell you, I had to go to the doctor and get my ears cleaned out here first of the week. Went there on Monday, I think it was, wasn't it? And they got to digging around in there and they was, my ears, they was itching me like crazy. So I had to go someplace to get my ears taken care of. I mean, they were itching me. I, I couldn't hardly stand it. I, I was like rubbing my ear off out here. But what there was a bunch of junk in there? And I went to somebody else and they said, well, put this in there or put that in there or do this or do that. But do you get down to the root of the problem is you got something in your life that's causing that thing there. It has to be taken away. And so what people have, they don't want the itching taken away. They just want the soothing of that itching. Well, it's all going to be okay. That's just a sign that you're growing. Hey, you're growing earwax. <laughs> So they're going to heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. I want, to, I want to be healthy and wealthy. So all of these teachers come and they preach health and wealth and these people give them the money and those preachers become very, very wealthy. Yeah. I don't know if you ever looked at them. They're starting to wear eyeglasses and their hair's turning gray and they're going to die one of these days. I don't care how much they tell you how healthy they are. Had one fellow I heard back when COVID hit. He said, I'm so holy. He said, COVID... A COVID germ hits me, he said, it'll fall off dead. He canceled his first two meetings. <laughs> he didn't do it because he was afraid. He didn't want the other people to. Right. They'll turn their ears away from truth and shall be turned unto fables. <clears throat> Storytelling in church instead of preaching. Yeah. But watch 
trust thou in all things. You see, I can't control what they do. I can't control what the world does. But I can control what I do. Yes. And you can control what you do. Yes. And he says, you watch. Keep on the alert in all things. That doesn't mean just at church. I mean in all things, all areas of your life. Watch out. Endure afflictions. Now, we don't like that. We don't want to be afflicted. We don't want to have problems. So we pray for the problems to go away. Well, that's, that's not wrong to pray for the problem to go away. But what you really need to be praying for is grace to come through whatever that problem is. Everybody has problems. I don't care what they are. You live in this world of woe, you're going to have woes. Amen. Problems. Physical problems, financial problems, spiritual problems, you just, they're, good, they're here. What we need is the grace to survive those things. God's help, God's mercy. Do the work of an evangelist. Tell somebody about Jesus. Yeah. Tell somebody about Jesus. Amen. Until you're gone from this earth, God's given you an opportunity to take the only thing to heaven with you that you can take, and that is somebody else. You ain't taking anything else from this world with you. Naked you came to this world and naked you're going out of it. You ain't taking nothing to heaven with you. The only thing that you can send on ahead of you then is the soul of somebody who needs Jesus Christ and needs to be saved. Amen. Right. Make full proof of thy ministry. Don't, don't just hit and miss. Be faithful. Full proof. Full proof. And then he says this in verse 6. For I am now ready. I am now ready. To be offered. And he was offered. Horribly put to death because of his faith in Christ. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. He said, I'm ready to be offered because I've done what I'm supposed to be here. He said, I know my departure soon is, is at hand. I know Nero's coming to get me. He's going to torch me up, light up one of his courts with my body. Gonna put me, he's already put me in with the lions. I've fought with the lions. I've been through all this whole realm. He said, but, but right now, he said, I, I know my departure soon. Why? Because I fought the good fight of faith. I finished my course. Paul could see the end of his life. He could see that he had come to that place where he was now going to have to yield it up to Timothy to take over the reins and to, to pick up the slack, so to speak, of what he was not able to do. And Paul said, I'm ready. I'm now ready. He says, Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. Now you know Paul was the one who taught us to be absent from the body to be present with the Lord. He knew that the moment he closed his eyes in this world, he was going to be with Jesus. Amen. It was the Apostle Paul said, it's far better for me, far better for me to depart and to be with the Lord. He said, but it's more needful that I'm here. That's back in the, further back in his, his ministry there. But Paul understood that there was a time coming when this world was going to give away and he was going to live in that world to come forever and ever and ever. And he understood that there was going to be a time of judgment in that world for how he had lived as a Christian. And he said, therefore is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. If you... <laughs> now we're not talking about salvation here. We're talking about... a Rewards that you're going to earn down here as a Christian. I'm not going to, I don't want to preach on that. Just what I want to preach on. Uh, are you ready? Am, I am now ready. I am now ready. I tell you what got me. And all of that was introduction. I don't have anything to do with my message, I guess. But what got what got me stirred up about this whole thought of uh, of being ready was was sitting and talking with those two gentlemen yesterday. I got, to, I got to talking with Uncle Ralph and, 
And we, we got to talking about my cousin, who she was supposed to not made it past last week, but you know she's still setting up, she's still smiling, still telling her kids what to do. But she knows that her departure is soon. The cancer is going to claim her life, and she's going, she's, she's going to go somewhere. And my concerns, I had concerns for her salvation. I was talking with Uncle Ralph about that, and 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 uh, I. I said that we we went and we sat and talked with her back when we had our family reunion last last summer, this past summer. And, and uh, well, I'll tell you what, she just flat out reassured you that she was ready. She wasn't trusting anything except for Jesus. She wasn't trusting that church. She wasn't trusting no priest. She wasn't trusting anything about Jesus to get her to heaven. She's ready. Uncle Ralph sat there and he said, you know what? I believe she's ready. Absolutely she's ready. And we got to talking about heaven and home and he, he said, you know what? He said, I'm ready. Yes. He's sitting down there and you're going through all these troubles and trials and you go from one moment, moment you're happy and you're healthy and the next minute you're down there you don't remember anything. You, you, there's things that are slipping your memory to time there. There's things happening to you uh, it, it, through the neurological uh, aspects of all of the trauma that happened to his brain. Uh, there is a coming back of his physical abilities, but there's still that constant fight. And, and man, how it wearies the body to be in this world and to be in that constant battle with this flesh. And it wearies the soul. Amen. He said, well, do they give, are they giving up and just want to go home? No, that's not what they're talking about. They're ready to go. They've settled things with God. There is no fear beyond this world of what's coming next. Amen. The grave doesn't hold fear for somebody who is ready to meet God. Amen. I was sitting over talking with Brother Fred. And uh, he said, we were sitting there, we were talking about the, the physical, and I was, we was we was talking about heaven and all that God had prepared for him, talking about how he got saved and what God was, had, was, had been doing in his life. He said, I'll tell you what. He said, I said I'm ready. He said, I'm ready. Uh, he said, I'm not trusting in anything except for Jesus Christ to get me to heaven. He said, I'm ready. He said, he said when I'm sitting here, and he said, I go through one of them dizzy spells. He says, I, said, I just pray, Lord, just go ahead and finish it on up. I'm ready. He went to his family over Thanksgiving. He was talking with them. And, and uh, he kept telling them, he said, you know, I'm ready. And they asked him, he said, what are you talking, you thinking about committing suicide or what? He said, no. He said, that doesn't have anything to do with it. He said, I'm ready to meet God. Yes. He said, I, he said, he said that is my prayer. God, take me out of this world. Take me out of this life. I said, and I got to talking to him, and I said, I said, you know, uh, Brother Fred, your life has, has been a testimony from the time you got saved. Yes, yes. I said, you've had to hobble through that door back there with your walker to get in and out, or I'd be helped to be, be able to stand up and, and to get back in. And now you're not able to because of, of the dizziness and, and more frailty to his body, by the way. Now, he's weaker now than he, than he was. It's, it's more difficult. I'm looking at it and I think, well, people criticize and they say, so well, they, it sounds like maybe they're giving up. Listen, until you've walked through those valleys, until you've been through those dark valleys, and I promise you, somewhere in your life, you're going to go through them. Yeah. Probably through some kind of a physical, uh, either illness or, or whatever it might be. The natural aging process brings us to a place where the frailty of our bodies just frustrate us so much. Amen. And we're standing there looking into a mirror and we feel like, you know, we can go out and jump rope and, you know, uh, lasso cattle and we can, whatever we want to do, we can go do it. But then, then all of a sudden the body says, no, I know you can't. <laughs> but one of these days we're going to be set free from this old body. Yes, But you're going to have to be ready because if you don't, you're going to go from the front from the, from the fire and from the frying pan into the fire. Yes. Life just gets worse after you die if you're not ready to die. That's right. Both of those 
gentlemen, I'm ready. I'm ready. Amen. The Bible says in the book of, of uh, uh, Amos, Therefore this will I do unto thee, O Israel, and because I will do this unto thee, prepare to meet thy God. Yes. People by the billions who are not prepared to meet God. The Bible says in the book of, of Habakkuk, Thou art of pure eyes than to behold evil. You know, God... <laughs> I remember when Elijah said to, to, the, to the king's men that he said that they, they sent him over there and there was only one fellow who sat there who was a believer. And Elijah told him, he said, you know what? If he wasn't sitting here, I wouldn't even look at you. Do you understand that if it wasn't for him who was sitting to right hand of the throne of God, God would not even look at you. But out of his respect for Christ and out of your faith in Christ, he brings you in as his son, as his child. So we can say, I'm ready to go. Yes. I'm ready. We come up with, with all kinds of things. Psalms chapter 40, verse 12. Innumerable evils have compassed me about, is what David said. He, he, got, he couldn't even count them all. My iniquities have taken hold upon me. Can, can you see that? He's sitting there and he's going through all the things that's happened and all the wrongs that's come down and everything that he's done wrong. He said, and his iniquity took a hold on him. I tell you what we need today is some good old-fashioned Holy Ghost conviction because of sin. Amen. People need to have their sins get a hold of them. Yes. That they can see in that sin their death. Yes. They can see in that sin their, right, their wretchedness. It humbled David. He said, so I'm not able to look up. I'm not able to look up. Why? Because it's sin. But God made it able. It was, it was David who said, blessed is the man whose sins are forgiven, to whom the Lord will not impute iniquity. He was forgiven for the, for the sin of murder. Of, of which there is no sacrifice in the Bible. There is no sacrifice to cover the sin of murder. He was a condemned to murder and condemned to die. But he wrote, Blessed is he to whom the Lord will not impute iniquity. Yes. God had taken it away from him. Forgiven him. Imagine how sweet that word forgiven must sound. In the ears of people who can say, I'm ready. I'm ready. My sins have been forgiven. Yes. I'm ready. When our world tumbles down upon us like it did to that Philippian jailer over in the book of Acts chapter 16 verse 30. When that world that we live in, all of the safety features and everything that we cling to, all of the safety walls, the structures around us, when the physical things pile in upon us or the financial things or the spiritual things build up and encircle around us, <laughs> we'll come digging up our things. We'll think about it. We'll, we'll think about, well, you know, I'm going to take my sword and kill myself. I'm going to fall upon the sword. But thank God there's a voice still crying out of the dungeons of this world. There's still a voice crying out of the dungeons of our heart. There's still a voice that cries out, look and live. Amen. That causes us to come and humble ourselves before Him and say, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Amen. What is it that I have to do to know that I'm ready to meet God? Amen. Yes. Paul said, believe on the Lord Jesus yes. Christ and thou shalt be saved. Faith in Him and faith in Him alone is the only thing that will make you come to that trial or tribulation in your life and say, I am ready. I'm ready. I'm ready because I found that there is but one way. I'm ready because I found that there is but one life. I'm ready because there's been a home prepared and for those that receive Him, I'm ready because there's only one way to the Father 
and I found him, and that's Jesus. I've come to that cross. I've come to the place where the gospel is preached, where he was delivered up for my sin, for my iniquities, where he was crucified on Calvary. His shed blood was the payment for my sins. His, his death, his burial, his resurrection, it should prove the power of Jesus to, to bring eternal life to anybody who received him. I don't know of anybody that's ever got up out of the grave and walked around except for Jesus. And that was a simple confession. That I will confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus. And shall believe in thy heart. You know, it starts down here. Yeah. The Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. That's why out of the abundance of my mouth, before I got saved, everything was sin. It was, yeah. it was curse words. It was using his name in vain. It, it was the filthy. I spoke of the things of this world. I thought about the things of this world. But when I got saved, there was something else in my heart. Yeah. Something down in here began to come out here. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, shall believe in thy heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Not that thou, thou might be saved. Or, you know, there's a possibility of you being saved, but that's past tense. Thou shalt be saved. Amen. To believe upon Christ is to have eternal life. I sat there and I was praying with uh, Brother Fred and I talked to him, I said, you know, the Lord's given you a great uh, open door to speak to a lot of people who don't have that same hope that you have. He said, I know it. He said, as, he said I know. They don't know. They don't, they don't, they don't understand. And, and he said, and I just tell him, I said, I'm ready. And he said, I leave it at that. He said, I'm not going to argue with him. I said, I'm just going to tell him that's, that's where I'm at. Mm -hmm. I said, you know, the Lord's given you a, a great open door to be a testimony. I said, now, I understand you're going through, you're suffering some things here that you don't want to be in, you don't want to go through. I said, but you're a testimony of God's grace. Yeah. I said, you were before you got saved. I said, you are now. We sat there and we began to pray. And I got prayed and I thanked the Lord for Brother Fred's salvation. I thanked him for his testimony. I thanked him for loving us and saving us. I thanked him for our eternal home. And I thanked him for the opportunities we have to tell others about him. And when I was done, I looked up and Brother Fred sitting over in tears just... Yeah. Just pouring down the side of his face. Amen. Sometimes life hands you things that you don't want. You'd have a whole lot of other way of getting done or bringing things to an end. But when down in the very depths of your soul there's enough peace that you can lift your eyes to heaven to knowing that your sins have been taken away. And you can say, I am ready. Paul said, I am now ready. What a gracious gift from God Amen. to be ready. To be ready. Let's pray. Father, I don't know if I've made any sense at all out of this. But I'm so grateful for it. I'm so grateful for salvation and for forgiveness of sin. I'm so grateful, Lord, that though these bodies fail us, you will never fail us. I'm grateful, Father, that when we stumble and fall, there's someone who's holding our right hand. I'm, I'm grateful, Father, that you've come to give us a peace that passes all understanding. You've come to give us a joy that this world can't have. 
I'm grateful, Lord, that we can look into the very depths of our life and know that one day we're going to stand in the presence of you who spoke this world into existence. Of you who are an absolute holy God that, have, that is of purer eyes than to behold evil. That one day you will look on us because of Jesus and you'll say, welcome home. Father, out of that trust and out of that faith, we can say, I am now ready. We love you, Lord. We praise you and thank you for such a gracious, wondrous salvation that we have in Jesus. We give you praise and all of the glory in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Ready. That all people would be able to say, I am now ready. But not all people are ready. And they'll never be ready until they know Jesus. Until they know Jesus. Amen.